Hello and welcome to the Made in New York Animation Project Mega Group. My name is Linda Sylvester and I will be your host for today. The group is scheduled to run from 3 to 4.30 p.m. But before we begin, let's go over some information about this webinar. This group will operate in webinar format. Attendees will not be able to turn on their video or microphone during mega groups. You are counted in attendance as soon as you logged in. You do not need to follow up with us regarding attendance. If you lose connection, try to rejoin the webinar as soon as possible. You will still receive your incentive even if you get disconnected from the webinar. All right, let's begin. We have a very exciting group ahead of us today, but before we start, let's go over today's goals. So first we'll have our opening ritual, then we'll go into group and incentives information, then our in animation industry guest speaker for today is Jeff Lopez. We'll go into a Q&A, and then we'll have our closing ritual. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Natasha Amendolara, a drama therapist and workforce development manager at TAP. Natasha, welcome. What's the opening ritual for today? Hi, Lyndon. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be back with you all this afternoon. As many of you know, in every TAP group, we always begin with an opening ritual together so we can enter the space together. And for today's ritual, we know we talk a lot about being creative in these groups and how to be successful. So today we're going to uh, ask you, what is your favorite way to de-stress? Because we know life gets in the way sometimes of us showing up as our most creative, successful selves. So when you're feeling stressed, what is your favorite way to de-stress and let that go? There are so many different ways. So if you think about that question and you think about your answer, please go directly to the link in the chat to answer this question. And when you get to the link, you'll see the question and a space to type in your response. So just be sure to click on the link in the chat now to enter your response. We'll give everyone some time to think about it and respond. And then we'll return here to this Zoom space and we'll watch your words come alive. Mm, get a lot. <laughs> Amazing. All right, what do we see there, Lyndon? All right, I see online shopping, sit and think, play basketball, and meditate. Nice. Sleep, always a good one. Sing, draw, love that. Anime, um, working out, really nice. <laughs> play some Animal Crossing, <laughs> make art, illustrate uh, games, look at funny stuff on YouTube. Yeah. Looking at funny stuff on YouTube. That's great. Watching a comfort show, taking a shower. Really good one. Um, mm -hmm. Hanging out with my sister, video games. Be with family, yoga, poems. Uh, let me see. Um, Reading manga, talking to a friend, laughing, one of my favorite ones as well. Ice cream, also one of my favorites. TikTok, deep breaths, drink coffee. It's definitely helpful. <laughs> Close your yeah. eyes. Oh, nice one. Play, jog, really nice. This is so great. They keep coming in. Really, really amazing responses. And, you know, this is so, so nice to share how we de-stress with the community because we can all learn from this and take some of these um, and use them for ourselves. Thank you all so much for, for offering your responses and all of these really amazing and creative ways um, that we can de-stress when, when things feel a little bit too much. These are really, really great. Oh well, yeah, definitely. Gonna steal some of those those uh ideas <laughs> for sure. Yeah. All right. So before we get into our guest speaker portion of the group, let's review some information about the summer summer mega groups and incentives. 
Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Lyndon. Sorry about that. Summer mega groups will run from July 14th until August 18th. And mega groups are always held on Wednesdays from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Every week, TAP will introduce you to a guest speaker from the animation industry. And you will have the opportunity to ask them questions by using our Q&A feature. Incentives information. When will I be paid? You will be paid for the groups you attended on July 14th, 21st, and 28th by August 11th. You will be paid for the groups you attended on August 4th, 11th, and 18th by September 1st. Now, how will you be paid? Well, you will receive your $10 prepaid Visa gift card in the mail at the address you provided when you registered. And the return address on the envelope will read the animation project, 413 West 14th Street, Suite 200, New York, New York, 10014. The card that you receive may be used for purchasing goods and services at any merchant that accepts Visa. And prepaid Visa gift cards are the only way to receive payment for this program. We do not offer alternative payment methods. Who to contact? So if you have any questions about your incentive, you can contact TAP Incentives at theanimationproject.org. Now, it's time to introduce our co-moderators for the guest speaker portion of today's mega group. Welcome back, Kat Kalaski and Brandon Paracon. Hi there, everyone. Hello, everyone. So it's uh, my genuine pleasure to um, co-host this Q&A conversation with the lovely Jeff Lopez, who is joining us this afternoon. Jeff is a veteran visitor or you know, veteran special guest, industry guest professional, um, who has spent many times with us throughout this, this Zoom room space. And we're just so happy to have him back. Um, it's also my pleasure to be spending some time here with Brandon, who is a resident expert uh, moderator here at, uh, at TAP. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to sort of segue into introducing Jeff Lopez, who is both a uh, VFX supervisor at the mill and also co-head of the CG department. So welcome, Jeff. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? I hope fine. <laughs> We're much happier now that you're here. So thank you, Jeff. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, asked to come back. I'm um, more than happy to chat with everyone in, in this uh, in this forum, and whatever I can do to help, then you know, uh, you know, answer any questions that everyone has, I'd, I'd be more than happy to do it. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, if you wouldn't mind, just sort of you know, sharing with us your story, how you entered the industry. Um, I know you brought a lot of projects to share with us today, so we're really excited about that. Um, but with that in mind, we'd love to hear how you how you became the talented artist that you are. Well, how far do you want to go back? <laughs> Wait, way back. Let's go way back. Way back. Well, okay. My my background, I guess, uh, is um, I come from a family that uh, is very artistic. My uncle is uh, is an artist uh, that uh, I you know from the beginning since I was five years old. He always contacted me. He lived in England during the time, um, and uh, I, I I grew up in uh, Venezuela, um, most of my childhood. Um, and then he, he kind of just, uh, you know, festered that sort of like essence of art. Uh, so he always like gave me like books and encouraged me to, to do art. Uh, my, my parents are not artistic at all, at all. But, uh, but my family does have them. My aunts and, and uncles, they are very artistic with their hands. Um, so I kind of had that uh, as a background. Um, uh, through, through elementary school, I was, I was okay with my art I got I got really good at fourth from fourth grade on something happened I don't know something snapped and uh, I started my my you know maybe maybe because I was probably drawing more often than not and I got better at it um, I came to the states at the age of 13 uh, knowing zero English um, so I had to learn really quickly at that age of 13 which I, as you guys are going through right now is a difficult time uh, the time when you start uh, trying to chat with girls and whatnot, and trust me, that was very difficult for me to do. Uh, but then, needless to say, um, I learned it. Um, I kept going with uh, art 
you know, I liked the technical part of it. I was pretty good at math. I was terrible in English. Couldn't uh, couldn't get Shakespeare for nothing. Um, but my two strengths were art and like the mathematics and all that sort of like figuring stuff out. Um, when I got to be senior year, uh, six, uh, I think maybe three months before graduation, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, just like many of us, when you finish high school, you have no idea what you want to do. Uh, I was in the same boat. Uh, I, my, my thing was like, oh, wait, I'm good at math. Maybe I'll go into engineering, computer. I apply. I was thinking maybe four-year college is not for me. So I applied to DeVry, which is a two-year college to get a degree in engineering. Uh, I applied to NGIT for, you know, just technicals. Again, I had no idea. And, um, and I think I was, uh, my senior year, uh, I was taking like an elective, which was art. And my art teacher said like, Jeff, what do you want to do? And I like, I don't know, I'm going to go engineering. He's like, you should go to art school. And uh, I didn't know that that was a thing to do. Uh, so because of the simple answer that he gave me, he's just like, you should just apply. You'll do, you'll do well. I'm like, okay. So I just gave it a try. Um, I saw that some of my friends, I think two of my classmates went to, went to Pratt and Parsons. Um, so when I spoke to them, I asked them like, you know, uh, you know, are you guys applying to that? He's like, yeah, we did. We're, we're, we got in and it's great. And I was like, got a curiosity, how much is it? And then it was $25,000, $22,000. And I was like, this is insane. I can't do that. That's my parents can't pay for that. Um, so my, I told my teacher, my teacher is like, you know, you should apply to this other school. It's called SBA, School of Visual Arts. Um, so at the time, in comparison to Pratt, it was like the cheapest version. I think when I started, it was $12,000 a year. Um, uh, it is a state school. So I apply like to do a lot of, a lot of grants, a lot of loans. Uh, you know, I took personal loans on myself. Um, I, I did get some grants because I was Hispanic, first one in the family to get into college. So I got some of that grant. Um, so I got help, but it wasn't easy. It, it, to get financial help, it was hard to do. Um, and, you know, they knew me by first name basis at the uh, office of, uh, um, you know, um, you know, the loan officer at this SBA. Um, um, anyways, you want me to stop or you should I still keep going? No, no, keep going. This is really, really great. And, and interesting. Right. I, I don't think um, Brandon objects. Do you, Brandon? I don't know. I, I'm enjoying hearing about your journey. All right. Um, all right, so then, um, so I'm in college. I got the accepting uh, letter. I'm super stoked because I'm going to go paint. So I was pretty happy. Um, but, you know, going from, um, you know, I came from a very small school. I was only like, um, um, I was a group one school in, uh, in, in New Jersey. I went to Palisades Park High School. So we only had like maybe 150 kids in my class. The whole high school only had 600. So we were a very small school. Um, and I was one of like three or four people who were actually pretty good at art. Um, so I was like, okay, I felt good about it. But when you go to college where everyone knows art, you, you become very humble, very, very fast because there was people there who were amazing about what they did. And it was not just drawing. They would, they were painters, they were musicians, they were, uh, editors, photographers. I mean, God, you name it. Um, they had a very good roster of, of artists. So it usually became very humble. In your freshman year, you take all these classes, right? You take your art, your, your, your drawing, your painting, your photography, your sculpturing class. So kind of like your base. And then I remember um, uh, I went as a graphic design major and I didn't know what that was. All I knew is had to do with art. So I'm like, all right, I'm good at art. I'm going to do it. So I was doing it. And then uh, another friend of mine um, uh, was doing computer art. So he was in the computer art major. And I was like, so when I went to see him, I saw he was doing stuff in the computer. He was drawing on the computer. And I was like, oh, I like that. What is that? And he's like, this is the computer art department. I'm like, well, I'm in the graphic design department. I want to go to your department. So um, I had to like basically transfer my sophomore year uh, to this department. But it was such a niche department that it was very difficult to get in. So like, um, People who were already in it, it's much easier to go, of course, because you're in that department. But if you wanted to go in only like maybe, you know, there was about 20 or 25 people that wanted to transfer to that department. And I was only two of those that got into that department. So I guess I was lucky that I was given the chance to transfer to this department. Um, and again, during that time, it's not, it's not like it is right now. The, 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 the software and the computers were very expensive. 
Each computer cost, cost about sixty to eighty thousand dollars, which at the time was called the SGI, silicon graphics machines. Um, and the software was also expensive, so it was we only had like I think it was something like maybe twenty machines, and they were about I don't know forty of us or something like that, thirty eight. So imagine you are trying to work on the computers, but you didn't have enough computers for everybody. So we kind of had to come up with a roster to do time on your machine. Uh, so when you know, so I you know I I learned computer art in sophomore, then junior year became, are right, you going to start doing your thesis? And then it, it took a lot of sacrifice because uh, the teachers um, didn't know the software as well as you would hope they did. Um, anyone that was good during that time was already working. So the teachers that we had were not as good as, again, as, as we wanted to do. So we only had each other. So we all had to learn. So I remember uh, learning the software is no longer in existence called Softimage 3D. And it was a French, uh, Canadian French company and their tutorials sucked. They were so bad. So, but my concentration was animation. But because I was, my mind works in a very technical aspect of it, I like the part of rigging. So I like the part of using math with computers. So it's somehow I create my created my own thing, which is put everything together and um, create rigs on, on, on characters. And I can animate that on top of that, make them move. And if they if I need something else, I can go back and fix it, add my controller and go back and animate. So I love that sort of continuous loop of doing it. So that was what I concentrate on when I uh, when I was doing my thesis. Um, and you know, you had to do everything. You had to do lighting, you had the modeling, you had to do texture, compositing. You know, you get a you know an overall view of that. Uh, but my concentration was animation and rigging. Um, and then soon after that, um, 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 I, I I was able to do my thesis with a friend of mine. And then I graduated, let's say, on a Wednesday, and I was already working on Thursday. Thankfully, um, I was uh, hired right away by Curious Pictures, where I did my first commercial uh, for Oscar Mayer. Um, and I've met uh, many people ever since that 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 spot that I still talk to right now. Uh, and we became we're still friends with the, the the group that I worked in the beginning of that spot. Um, and after that, it's just it's been moving around the city, uh, working in different companies. Anyways, that's like pretty much like how it all started. No, it's a, it's a great story that you're sharing, and I really I really appreciate how transparent and candid you are about your trajectory because I think that really resonates with so many of our participants. I wanted to also note the fact that Brandon and you have a lot in common, and that he also went to SVA. Yeah, it's awesome. interesting to hear how different it was back in the day. Yeah, it, it's it's different. I've 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 visited a quite few times, and it's so much better. So again, uh, remember, there was um, when I started, there was no internet. Um, um, only two years after, like maybe sophomore, junior year, like that's when everyone was like, I got my first uh, email, Hotmail, doing college, and then everyone started playing. Or it wasn't the thing, so it just became. And there was no YouTube. There was just very little places to find information. Yeah. So right now, everything is so readily available that it's, it's 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 ludicrous for me to think that. You know, you know, there should not be an excuse if you if you want information, if you want stuff, it's there. It's not one. There's hundreds of thousands of people doing the same thing you're doing. So you should be able to create anything your mind is set. In my opinion. Very, very nicely said. I really appreciate that. Um, I guess so. Without further ado, we'd love to have you, Brandon and I collectively would love to have you talk through some of the projects that you've worked on. Sure. Um, I'm conscious that our participants are really excited to see some of the things that you've been up to as of late. Um, and have sure. So um, just so you guys have a clear understanding, like I work at the mill um, and I used to be the, uh, the rigging supervisor and the animation supervisor. Um, I was uh, given the opportunity to now to lead the team. So I'm the co-head of the CG department now. So um, um, while I'm there, while I, I was there, I've been there for about 11 years, I'll give you a rundown of the mill is a pretty much, a, a, is one of the biggest post-production house in the world. Uh, therefore, we get to do a lot of work with different types of animation. So um, animation, um, you know, as you know, it could be anything that has motion. So either whether it's a camera, whether it's an object, whether it's a box, whether it's a ribbon, whether it's an animal, whether it's a dragon, it no, doesn't matter. Anything that has motion, we have to do at the mill. So I've been, um, you know, I have no qualms of what I have to do. I give, um, every time I, I get to do something, I give it 
uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, at the end of the day, is your name is on that spot and you just have to treat it as your artwork. Uh, it represents you and the company. So you want to make sure that you do the best as you can, no matter how mundane the job would be or that task would be. Um, because at the end of the day, you are part of a group of people. You're not doing it alone. So anyway, some of the, on the examples that I'm going to show you, you'll see that there's a huge range. Uh, some of the jobs I, I, I have I work, um, um, uh, you know, directly or indirectly, or some of them are just uh, work that I think you guys would find it uh, interesting. So anyway, so let me uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully, it's not too choppy. So um, again, I know that the 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 groups that we have here is between the ages of uh, twelve and twenty four. Um, so. I know the range and I hopefully they'll understand the terms that I'll, that I'll be talking about. Um, so here's, I have a whole bunch of examples of different things. So this project that I have in front of me, do you guys see, can, can you see my cursor moving around Kat? Yes, definitely, thank you. Okay, good. So this project was uh, Einstein. Um, it, it took a couple of months to develop, but it was an interesting thing. Um, if everyone's familiar with the MetaHumans um, with Unreal Engine, um, we started doing this before MetaHumans came out and we were doing it actually in Unreal Engine. Uh, but once Unreal Engine came, we stopped developing it in Unreal Engine and we went to the traditional way, which was doing it in Maya. So uh, I have two examples of like the making of it and the actual spot. So perhaps I'll just show you the actual spot, uh, which is uh, an actor pretending to be Albert Einstein and we, uh, we kind of replicated his head. So we did like maybe, I don't know, six, seven different spots. So this is like the first one. Ooh, hello. This is very impressive. Ooh, already five likes. Mm -hmm. But your national energy system, this gets no likes from me. If you don't digitize your system, poof. So. Why am I in the tub telling you all this? Two words, the smart meters. The smart meters help make the system more efficient and help Britain use greener energy. How rude. Smart meters, join the energy revolution. So um, I'll tell you a little, uh, I, um, how can I say, like the guys who created this were, were very, peculiar people, uh, team that, that did this. The guy who was in charge of doing the facials or the facts uh, was Harsh Barak, who was one of the leaders in Lion King, who, who did a, mo a lot of the antelopes and uh, the, the monkeys and some of the tiger alliance. So he created this new setup of blend shapes. Now, these are not necessarily regular blend shapes, which are just smile, uh, you know, frown and all those shapes, we created was a, a sequence of shapes. So example, when you move your jaw down is, you know, you have, let's say two shapes, you have mouth closed, mouth open, mouth closed, but we, you know, that motion is, is, not, is not linear. It actually has like a curve on your jaw when you, when you open it and close it. So we created those in between shapes. So instead of being two shapes, it actually became six or eight shapes. So that gave us more of fidelity of the way the character uh, uh, you know, moves and talks. Uh, here's a little making of it. And let's see, hopefully it's not too strobe so you can see um, why it was done and how it was done. Oh, hello. This is a first for me. Today, I won't be talking to you about relativity, but instead, I will explain how I was created in a complex 3D form. This is impressive. Yes, hi, my name is John Karofsky.
pretty complex, but um, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. So the the facial of this was not um, mocap. So basically, none of the recording were, ha were were done on the face. This were key animated by a very talented lady. Don't remember her name because that this was done in London. But uh, it was key key frame, um, and it was really dead on. It was really really good. Um, I'll tell you a little secret that after this was done and it was finished, the agency changed the BO. So after you know working for weeks and months on making it look exactly insane, you know, enunciating everything, they changed the audio, and um, that's why sometimes when you look at it, it looks like it, she's not uh, or Albert Einstein's not saying the words is because they changed the VO towards the end of the project. Um, so that was that. Um, and I know everyone's into animation. So um, I can show these. Uh, these, I, I was leading these, I was animation leading this, these two spots that were, they were for Mountain Dew. So I did, the, I did the rigging, the animation. I supervised the, the mocap shoot, which happened in Vancouver. Um, and I used a, a very similar uh, approach with the fact shapes to create these characters. So I'll show you this. Now, if you think that was difficult, you, if you put all of the storms together, this is the really difficult spot that we had to do. It's one camera, one camera, 900 frames. Um, it was tons of effects. Um, it was divided into three different sections, and that was the only way we could get done. Uh, so after the previous was done, I, I had to take you know, my task was to make sure that this kind of worked together. And in the middle of it, I don't know if you guys noticed, there are two time warps, which it goes from, you know, 24 frames per second, then it goes to like 80 and it goes really, really slow, picks up again and it does it again. So it was, uh, it was kind of hard to get to that point. Um, I'll show you another one. This was only a 15 second spot, but this actually looks pretty good. And I, I really enjoyed the effects on this. <laughs> Get double XP and Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War with Mountain Dew, rated mature. Jeff, these are amazing. And actually, um, we're starting to get some wonderful questions coming in from our participants. Sure, let's, let's answer questions. Um, just very quickly, and for, and for those of you within this, uh, this Zoom room, please feel free to populate the Q&A with your questions, because Brandon and I will happily address them for you, such that Jeff can can be put to work, as it were. Um, Shamima is wondering, how long do these projects take on average? So let's say looking at the last two projects in particular, um, how long would these projects have taken? So for the Mountain Dew ones, those were done during the pandemic. Um, so uh, it, it took, um, I believe, I'm gonna, I'm, I don't know exact as exact dates, but probably between six, six weeks to eight weeks to do. Um, the Albert Einstein one, they took longer, um, I think, was because um, when you get jobs like this, they usually take a lot of effort in the beginning to do. So it took us, like I would say, probably like eight months, nine months to do. But that was more like a longer schedule to develop this character. And then once it's done, then we, we banged out all these five different spots really quick. So I'll, I'll show you this one was, I'll take the video out, you know. Uh, that was like the epitome of like what I was supposed to do. So when we did the next spots, he doesn't really talk. He's just doing an action. So it was once the character is done, it's much easier to create the characters. So here he's not, he's just like, you know, we do some of you know, these long shots and that's it. So we did like five of them. So yeah, so sometimes it depends. It can take between, you know, two weeks to six, eight weeks to do a spot. Thank you. And then another question before you show your next spot, and sorry to, to keep bombarding you. Uh -huh. um, Lord Blackburn is wondering, what were the challenges that you might have faced throughout some of the projects that you've shared with us? 
Uh, like I mentioned, one of them, uh, I would say the first one was the Mountain Dew one. Uh, the challenge was that, hey, we were in a pandemic and we were all working from home. Um, so uh, in, uh, uh, you know, working with teams all over the world, it's, it, it, it was hard to, to schedule that. Um, and the other yeah. one was a supervisor shoot that was happening in Vancouver. So I couldn't fly over there to overlook that the, the, what they were shooting for the mocap. So I had to do it virtually. Uh, so that was a challenge. And then, um, like I mentioned before, like, you know, that particular spot that it was one camera moved 900 frames, there was no way to cut it. So you couldn't fake anything. Um, it was a lot of effects and effects are expensive. So we kind of had to develop a system that yeah. could take all of them at once. So that was, uh, that was, you know, the challenge that we had to do for that one. Um, yeah, so any, any job will have its own, its own problems. Um, like uh, when we did the camel for Geico, uh, where the guy says uh, hump day, you know, the camel, uh, when we were shooting it, he would eat all the plants that were uh, next to him when he was walking in the hallway. So we had to like make sure that Caleb, the camel, wouldn't eat any plants. So we, we had to shoot him in a way that he was far away from the plants. So every job has done. I appreciate that story because when you and I both worked at the mill, I remember that being an issue. <laughs> yeah, that's an issue. Um, okay, so here's another example of a job that we did with a combination of the Chicago office. And these characters is what Kat likes to call squishy and squashy characters. They have a very like rubbery arms, you know, the hose thing. And it was for Dairy Queen. <laughs> Today we say so long summer and hello fall with the new DQ Fall Blizzard menu. There's the always festive pumpkin pie, tasty new caramel apple pie, and more delicious fall flavors than ever right now on the new DQ Fall Blizzard menu. If you're craving fall, you can find it at DQ. Happy taste good. So that was, again, those are really cool, fast uh, jobs that we get to do and they're fun to do. They're characters who have, you know, they're very squashy and then you can make them do whatever you want in comparison to, you know, other characters and other jobs that we do. Um, um, sometimes we get to work on, on, on spots that make a difference or has a good message. You know, it's not like about selling something, it's about selling Oreos or Pepsis or whatever it is. Sometimes we get some really good ones and this was a good one. Um, this was done from the studio of London. Um, and uh, obviously, as you can see, what we had to do was a Komodo dragon. Um, and the Komodo dragon symbolizes something that um, you guys should take a listen. We started off just messaging. He must have been 14. I couldn't believe that he liked me. He was always buying me things, gave me lifts from school. We started to call back to his. He asked me to do stuff. He said it was normal because he loved me. But you've helped me see what he was doing. Since coming to Bernardo's, I feel a bit more like me again. So it was a strong message and, you know, these are the jobs that, you know, they're, they're cool to work with. Uh, I've been um, lucky enough to work on some really good spots for the mill, um, even Super Bowl spots. So uh, I'm proud to say that we've done one of the most iconic spots, which is the Budweiser spots that we've done with uh, the dogs and the, and, 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 and the horses. But we have also done like the worst spots for, for, for the Super Bowl. So we have both. We have the best ones and we have the worst ones. So, so good range. So we're good range on that. Um, any questions, Kat? Um, Jeff, I have a question. Uh, sorry, I haven't been speaking too much. Um, so I was curious because you mentioned that you're a, a, an animator and a rigger. Um, do you have a preference when it comes to the, the things you're animating? Do you prefer to work on characters, creatures, uh, props or environments? Um, I mean, I have, I, I love like every job has its own thing, you know? So I enjoy working on cool stuff. I like to make stuff. So, you know, I worked, I've done 
tons of dragons. So dragons are, are, are painful to do sometimes, depending on the director, but they're cool to do. Uh, it, it's just the process of getting them approved by the, the director's vision is always the challenge. But I love to animate like, you know, all the Mountain Dew jobs were, were really cool. I, I really enjoyed this. It, it was a challenge, but it was good. But I also enjoy working on characters like this or creating or animating cars. Um, at the end, uh, you know, um, it's, 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 I'm creating. And the fact that uh, I have a, you know, I earn a living creating is, um, for me, is what's really rewarding. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but, but yeah, I mean, I like to do cool stuff. Obviously, the Apex stuff that, that, I was able to work on Apex. Uh, it was great. It was challenging, but I'm happy to do whatever it's, uh, it goes in my lap. Awesome, thank you. No problem. So I'll show you another cool job that we did over in LA. Um, and this was basically taken after we did the Albert Einstein project, we took a lot of the knowledge that we learned on that. And then we applied it to this, to this job, which was a trailer for D&D. &D. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's pretty cool. And the same facial setup that we did for Einstein, we did it to these characters. <laughs> All right, here's the plan. Luna, get close to provoke her. Attack from a distance to give us cover. We'll find you. All right, remember. Bomb, bomb, bomb. So, yeah, that was that. There's your dragon. But um, it was fun. They, they did a great job on it and stuff. So it was good. Um, any questions, Kat? Nothing coming through your way? Quite a few questions I know that Brandon has as well. Um, and we're, getting, we're starting to get some really wonderful questions from our participants. Brandon, do you want to jump in? I know you uh, I just wanted to note that that looked like it was a fun project to work on. I myself am a D&D &D fan. And watching um, that, um, there's a lot of silliness that goes on in that tra in that cinematic piece. So that was awesome. Yeah, it was, it was so that dwarf was just really funny to, you know, the comedic uh, timing is great. Um, I mean, you know, it had its challenges, obviously, you know, time frame and, you know, uh, and so many characters that needed to be done, you know, it was a, it was a good help between uh, the London office, the New York office, and the LA office. Uh, had a lot of effects, if you notice. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's challenging, but, it, it, you know, look, at the end, it looks great. You know? uh, we try to keep, uh, you know, remember that this is a commercial, it's not a, a movie. Uh, so the movie uh, would have like, you know, months of R and D and develop, and we only have weeks to do this. So uh, it helps that we have great, great artists, great pipeline, and great support from everyone. So you know we can do you know cinematics like this. Um, I did. I do have a question that I wanted to ask. Um, uh, if I can find it, hold on. Uh, all right. Uh, a lot of I know animators uh, often search for reference when they're animating, and they oftentimes record themselves. 
um, for reference. Uh, can you speak to that? And are there any techniques or habits that help you with animation? Um, yeah, so, you know, I had a, maybe a reference here that I had. Yeah, so I take, I, I do take references if I need it. Um, so, you know, I did a, a, a Schick commercial uh, in, um, oh, let me see. And, you know, I basically recorded myself, um, you know, you know, getting up to create what is it that this presence that this person has. So I do use video reference when I get to do animation. A lot of times I get my wife to do it for me um, um, because either sometimes as a female or I just want to get her point of view, you know, trying to make it as, as, as normal and as simple as possible. Like I know what I need to do, but I want to get someone else to do it. So I just tell her, pretend you're grabbing a straw with your mouth and you're not. So she would do that. And I was able to use that as a reference for another job that I had to do. Um, so yeah, I, I looked at reference for that. Um, sometimes if there's no reference uh, acquired, for example, uh, a dragon, uh, the best reference you can get is uh, like a, a big animal, like an eagle, condor, and a bat. So if you combine them both, you get some really good reference for, for a dragon. Um, there was a job that we had to do for a, an elephant walking, or an elephant on a unicycle. So how do you get reference for that? So we actually type uh, man or big man on a unicycle, and we got the reference on YouTube, and we use that our for our job as a reference. So YouTube now has tons of reference, so you should, shouldn't have any problem finding it. Um, so yeah, so I use it whenever necessary. That's awesome. So uh, if, again, if everyone, anyone has any questions, please, um, I hope that uh, the, the way I'm talking to you guys, you find it relatable. I know exactly what you guys are going through, you know, especially if you're in elementary school, high school, or going into college or in college or already doing this and how you feel about doing that. You know, I'm an open book. Just ask me any questions that you guys have. I've been in your situation. So just ask. Cool. So anyway, this project is, this one over here is really long. It's three minutes long. So what I did is I, I help uh, with the pre of this spot. Uh, so the beginning, the beginning sequence is what I worked on until they looked at the ship. So that was like my job is to make sure that that kind of works. And somewhere in the middle, I kind of help with some of the, you know, the timing. So how do you time this up? And it's three minutes long. So we all kind of help each other out on this. Let's see. Oh, man. That thing is keeping us so really nice. Oh, come on, dude. You're always crowded. Oh, come on. 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 Oh, my God, so that was the plan, right? Okay, uh, new plan, follow the rocket. Uh, wait, wait, what? Do you know how to fly? Do you? Do you? I know how to fly. So this, you know, working on this project was fun. It was enjoyable. Um, you get to work with some really uh, cool rigs. So uh, this guy was, was really funny to work with. Um, and there was a new characters that you'll see coming up. Um, but it, you know, it's, um, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, there's tons of mocap that you have to fix and, and adjust it. So again, you know, even though you see that it's all mocap, there's a lot of stuff that you still have to do by hand, like the camera moves and all that stuff, you know, to make it look cinematic, like all these, this sequence was, was great. Um, this, I forget, I forgot the guy who worked on it, like, you know, I saw the progression of it and once he took over and made it look so much better. Like this shot over here, that was all like he animated. A lot of this stuff and then like the facial, even though we, we do get uh, facial uh, animation, we still have to go there and adjust it and enhance it. Like all this stuff is like key animating. None of it is, is mocap. Um, these are all such incredible projects, Jeff, and uh, our, our, you can tell by our participants and by Brand and myself, we're also collectively excited to see what you've been working on. Um, and it's such a wide range of the types of projects. Now, Myra's wondering, is there a style of animation that is most difficult to do? I mean, it, it, it becomes of like, what, what are you good at? You know, we, we do have some animators who are really good at like organic uh, animation, like meaning animals. They just know their physique you know, physiology really well. 
they know how to create weight. Um, so we do have some animators who are very good at that. We also have other animators who are more like traditional animators who are 2D oriented and their stuff, they, they enjoy doing like squishy squashy characters. Um, so it all depends, like trying to have like a balance is, is, is what's hard. And I try to do that. I try to be as balanced as, as I possibly could. I, I might not be the best character stuff. I might not be the best organic uh, animal, but I'll give it a try and I'll try to make it a look at reference and try to make it look as realistic as possible or as cartoony as possible. So yeah, you know, you, some people are good at other things, but sometimes I'm good at other things. So it's trying to mix it and trying to make sure you get the best team for that project. Any more questions, Kat? Well, there are plenty of more questions. Oh, damn. damn okay. And actually, I don't mean to put Brandon on the spot as well, but this, this question, because you're both such talented rigorous slash animators, um, Naomi is wondering from our, our audience, as a rigger, what is the easiest and hardest part of the rigging process? As well as for animation, what is the easiest and hardest part of, of that process? Go ahead, Brandon. Um, <laughs> for myself, uh, I know that um, for me, the hardest part is uh, getting the skin weights right when making a facial rig. Um, also creating, um, I, I prefer to uh, create a, a mix of blend shapes and joints for the facial rig. Um, so that's what I find myself spending uh, a lot of time on. Um, uh, for me, the hardest part as a rigger at uh, the mill is that even though I'm a rigger, I'm not the only one animating it. You have a team of people animating it. So you kind of have to make the, the rig uh, easy enough for someone to grab it and create what, what they want it to do. You, the worst thing you want to do is give a rig to someone that has to fight with the rig in order to create what you want to do. So that is a huge challenge. Uh, you know, try to, you know, mix the technical aspect of it with the artistic part of it. So you want to make sure that you have good enough rig that is not as complicated, that is easy to, to run at, you know, 30 frames per second, if not higher, and, and, and make it that the, the rig can do anything the animator want, wants to do. So that is, that is a big challenge um, that, you know, it's never easy. Um, when I have to do it myself, it's fine because I, I can animate, oh, that doesn't work. I go back to the rig add another attribute and go back and forth. When you have a team, you have to be more conscious about that. I can relate to that. Um, it, here at TAP, we have a, 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 a base character for our, um, we had one for our, our Burrow storytelling series. And um, I jam-packed a bunch of features into it, um, but I wasn't as uh, selective in where I placed them. And so when I handed it off to the other animators, they weren't, they animated using the base controls and they didn't know there was attributes on the side that they could manipulate. Yeah, yeah, exactly my point. Questions <laughs> trickling in. Um, Ariel is wondering, what kind of computer and software should a person invest in if they wanted to get into animation? Um, personally, right now, the flavor of the month that everyone knows about is Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is a free software. If anyone knows about it, it's a free software. Um, they have tons of stuff where you can create your characters really quickly. So uh, uh, as an advice for anyone who is uh, entering into this industry, I would say this is another path that you guys can take. Um, if you have... Um, a decent computer, you might be able to run it. If you're doing animation, I think you'll be fine. If you're doing rendering and simulation, uh, you may need to have a, 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 a you know a bigger, more expensive computer. But if you just do an animation, I think with a, a simple uh, a computer, you should be able to do it. Uh, it they'll provide the software provides you with a, a rig, which I, I mentioned before. It's called Meta MetaHumans. Um, um, you can customize it to create your own uh, MetaHumans. Um, they pair up with this uh, other company where uh, you have the marketplace or uh, Quixel, which is mega scans, and then you can create content. So think of it on real as a stage where you can put all your stuff together and then you can create. 
So that's the idea. And if you guys want to do that, I would suggest um, look into that. Um, there is Blender as well as another uh, software that you can do to create models, I think even to rig. And if you have the ability to use Maya at home, or if you have uh, like this, the place that we're talking about, you, you, you know, you just use Maya and there's, you know, easy uh, rigs that are given free for you guys to, uh, to practice. So the more you do it, the better you get. Um, I have a question here from, uh, I apologize if I'm saying this wrong, uh, Mushfiq Milan. Um, his question is, or their question is, uh, which, which device is best for doing animation and graphic design, uh, MacBook or Windows? Well, think of it as a very expensive brushes. So it doesn't matter what software you have. If you have good, talented talent, you, you can do anything you want with whatever they put in front of you. So uh, this question has come, uh, it comes a lot with uh, students. Um, and uh, you know, I'll let you know that I started with a software that is no longer active right now. And I had to learn ever since three other softwares, but the basic knowledge or the basic principles of animation are still intact. And you can use them in any, any software you use, whether it's Houdini, whether it's Blender, whether it's Maya, you know, um, uh, Cinema 4D, it doesn't matter. Um, there are some uh, differences in softwares in terms of like how easy it is, how user-friendly it is. Um, you know, Maya is the standard for everyone that's into animation. Um, but if you go to different companies, like you guys have or Pixar or Disney, they have their own software. So it doesn't really matter which software you know, as long as you have good talent, good basic principles, you can go, the sky's the limit of where you can go. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, though also, I have heard for graphic design work, the um, MacBooks are, are a little better just because there's... I think there's uh, it's a little more compatible with like fonts and stuff um, and windows for more like 3D work. That is correct. Two, two peas in a pod over here. It's quite fun to see you sharing the same space. Um, I guess I'll sneak in another little question from the, the Q&A because you're asking such wonderful questions, everyone. Uh, Jaden was wondering, um, looking back at the Mountain Dew commercial that you shared, how is it to make all of these big moving objects interact with each other? Um, how is it, like, I don't understand the question. How is it? Give me it. How was it, to, how, how do you sort of have the larger scale objects interact with each other? Um, well, a lot of it is fake. A lot of it is called map painting, right? So, uh, you know, you, you paint something and then you put it all the way far back. And then it looks like it, it goes in forever, but it actually doesn't. Um, we, you know, we do stuff in layers, um, uh, and in even the um, uh, the uh, uh, the environment that was created, we did it with uh, mega scans. Um, and I think it's like um, we bought like a kit batch of uh, destruction of some sort of city, and then we moved it around and we placed it in ways where you. It looks bigger than what it is, but it isn't. It's just, you know, again, it's just baked. So transparent, like, you know, layers that you put next to it. Um, it was still hard to do anyways. Um, and one limitation that we have, if you notice, the camera goes from, from this point of view and it doesn't go past here. So you have like the range of vision is only this section. So if you look at it as a pie, instead of creating, um, because in the beginning, the, the, the director wanted to move the camera 360 degrees. So if you move the camera 360 degrees, you have to build a lot of the city. So we told them, no, 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 no. All you can do is move the camera no more than 150 degrees. And they, 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 they agree with it and that's what we did. So if you notice the camera just goes from here to here, that's it. Um, I have, there's a question here in the chat from uh, Isaiah Alexis. Uh, can you ask Jeff what was the first project you worked on? Yes, I mentioned my first project was uh, working at Curious Pictures, working on my Oscar Mayer commercial for Lunchables. It's vividly in my mind because that was my first project. Um, and um, I, was, um, I was lucky, like I mentioned, I graduated one day. The next day I was working. Um, and I was working alongside the guy who I did the thesis with. 
So my thesis was done with my friend, uh, Greg Alvarez, and we, 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 wor we worked at this company alongside with another uh, uh, classmate of ours. So we were just straight out of school. We just came and started doing this commercial, had no idea what we were doing um, because we were never done production before. Um, so the pay was very little, but it didn't matter. I was like, I was happy that I was getting pay for what I went to school for. And that was like, to me, that was like the epitome. I was like, I was happy, even though I wasn't making that much money. Um, but, um, um, you know, you build upon those, those connections that you make. Um, and like I mentioned before, while I was working on that project, you know, they brought in more people and more people. And the guy who was sitting next to me um, became a good friend of mine. And then another guy that sat here hired me after that project to work on another commercial. And it just then, you know, it, you, you just grow from that point on. You know, like, like the industry is really small. And then this person told this person that, oh, I work with Jeff on this project. And all of a sudden, after three or four months of working, I was getting calls from another company. Like, hey, we heard you work with so-and-so on this. Do you want to come work for us? And so I did that for the first, like, I don't know, maybe two, three years as like a freelancer. And then after that, I landed my first job and I moved around. Um, so I worked in 10 companies so far in 25 years or so. Pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> It, no, it's, it's just amazing when we when we go back in time and have our conversations, Jeff, about you know your work history. It's just so fascinating, and you've worked at so many incredible studios and you know throughout the the, the East Coast. And it's just it's incredible to see your your portfolio. So thank you. Um, Ariel is wondering, with that in mind, um, have you ever created an animation? This is a really great question. Using the likeness of a real life person who is still alive where they found that the way that they were portrayed was an issue. Like, are there any moral or ethical issues that come up with creating an animation based on real people? I can think of two. Uh, one, uh, we worked on, this was another company, and we, this was then, the, the kids probably won't remember, but there was a show back in the day called The Sopranos. And, and during The Sopranos, um, there was a character, the mom that died while they were shooting. Uh, so we had to, um, we had to create, we had to take um, um, sh shots from other, uh, other sequences and enhance them and like, you know, do like a 2D cheat effect on a stunt double. So when the guy goes and talks to his mother, you know, we took, we, you know, cut out her, we put it on top of the double and we, you know, we, we had her have a dialogue with her son. Um, this was done. And a very, it was controversial during that time because he was already dead. And this was many, many years ago. And then they, they spoke to our CEO of the company and they asked him about that question about the ethical of being a person that was dead. And then somehow you're going to bring it to life. Um, so, um, you know, they, they decided that it was the best thing for them to do at the time. Um, but ever since then, all of a sudden, like how many people, you know, look at Fast and Furious, the guy who, who, who died in the car accident, he was being portrayed by by his brother. So it, it, it become, has become kind of like a normal thing to do. Um, another thing that is, that is quite funny was uh, we did a spot in New York of a chimpanzee. Um, and the chimpanzee was so, well, at the time, it, it looked so real and so good that Jane Goodall, I think her name is, who is an anthropologist who has studies chimpanzees was quite struck by like the way this chimpanzee looked. So she was very surprised to know that it was a fake one. You know, it was, on, it was, it was just made out of digital uh, zeros and ones. So she was uh, take, taken by like, she's like, her, she studies chimpanzees for a whole life. So seeing a video of a, a commercial and she was fooled by it was, was an honor from us, from the artists that we were able to fool uh, such an important person. That's it. Um, so Jeff, I have a question from you know, just myself. Um, uh, I, I reviewed some of your past work and um, I saw that you worked on many iconic and memorable characters such as um, Fiona from Shrek. And I saw you did a 
uh, the Chips Ahoy cookie, as well as there's one more, I can't remember. But um, do you have a favorite character that you've worked on? I, if I if I'm thinking this far, no, <laughs> I don't. Um, I, I I have my favors. Like I, I I did love to work on the dragon for Skyrim. Uh, that was a, a a a good challenge that I had to overcome. Um, the director hated dragons, so um, um, we needed to have that dragon in that spot. And from the get go, he was like, I hate dragons. So for me, it was a challenge to make it look, re, you know feasible and looked good and it was it was a point of the story and at the end we kept it and they, he liked it so you know that to me was like a challenge and, and and i liked it um i mean the characters i mean i love m&ms i think i have a heart for the m&ms i've i've done some past work for the m&m characters the yellow is my favorite one um and we're doing stuff right now at the mill with uh, the characters so it's kind of it's kind of you know it's a cool thing to do uh, the Chips Ahoy was also really good. I was able to uh, work with uh, Nathan Love on uh, and did some two spots for them. Um, yeah, so uh, you know every every little thing is just like again I don't I don't mind what it is as long as it's creative and it 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 you know I, I'm just that I'm making stuff that that to me is like the re reward. Awesome, thank you. No problem. Brandon coming through with all these amazing questions. Um, I'll, meanwhile, I'm going to show you another spot. This is, you know, I got to work on this too. I was the admission lead on this. And I got to do the car. Some, some, some parts of this was a car. And the idea was that it needed to look like a toy car. So again, as an animator, it's like, okay, well, I need to animate a car. Well, not a car. It needs to look like a toy car. So how do you do that and, and whatnot? So I'll show you. been dreaming about this car since you were eight policy from American Family Insurance. Insure carefully. Dream fearlessly. So again, we get to do other stuff that is not, you know, characters, you know, they're just simple cars and whatnot. Um, thank you for sharing. It's another, another great spot sponsored by, sponsored by yours truly. Um, one of the other questions that um, one of our participants, Anonymous, um, is wondering is, how important is storyboarding for these short animation jobs? Um, not all the spots are storyboard, or not all the, sh uh, all the commercials are storyboard. Some of them are, especially the complicated ones. Um, I, you know, as, as you remember, the, um, uh, for example, the one for uh, Mountain Dew, that was boarded, um, but it can, the boards, since they're in 2D, they're hard to predict on a camera move that is in 3D. So at least we have a story, right? So that, and you know, someone will do the storyboard and they would edit it to create the timing of it. And that to me is like the base. Okay, that's my base. That's, that's what my time is. I know I need to be on this character for X amount of frames and I go to the next one and go to the next one. So the storyboards are very important in the beginning before you start creating a previs. Then once you take the storyboards and then you create the previs, then you can start like finessing the time, you know, because the person walks and it takes three and a half seconds as opposed to three seconds to do that move. So that's, you know, the boards is just the initial step and then you move on to the next one. So storyboards are very important. I see we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, they ask, uh, which is more profitable when you work in the field of animation, working as a freelancer or working for a company? What's more profitable? Um, I, don't, I, I don't understand what that would be. Um, it becomes a personal choice, right? So um, when I started this industry, I didn't think of the money aspect of it. To me, it was more artistic. So I, when I went to college, again, I didn't know what I was, even when I was in college, I didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, I guess 
could you can say that it was lucky enough that it's actually a profitable uh, career, that uh, it does pay well and is there is some longevity on it. Uh, hence, I'm, 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 I'm a living example of it. I've been doing this for 25 years. So um, again, it, we can have this, you know, the answers could be very long on this, but it's up to you what the personal choice would want to do. Are you in the industry? Are you in this industry to to make money or to create art? So um, all I can say is that doing doing animation, it takes hard work. It's not easy. It's not for everybody. If you like what you do, you call it passion. If you don't, you call it work. So you have to be passionate about what you do because you're gonna do some late nights. You're gonna do some late 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 work. That's a given. You don't have the nine to five job. If that's the case, become a banker because that's not what you're doing here. You know, you have to do this because you, you like to create, you like to do art. And as an artist, you're never satisfied with your work. So, um, so I don't know about the question about, is it profitable? I've met many people who have a hard time finding jobs, even though they're doing animation. At that time, it could be, could be personality. It could be talent. There's so many, there's so many variables. But I think, you know, um, be, be in, do this because you want to do it because it's a lot of work. It's not easy. It's a lot of work that you have to put into it and sacrifice. Um, uh, I do want to add, speaking to that, the, um, I feel as, uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel that working at a company is a little more secure than um, working as a freelancer because freelance is more job for, if you can land a job, then you, uh, have money but otherwise you're right with right yeah i mean I, i'm probably didn't answer the question on that yes uh so again it becomes a, a personal choice because i've done both i have done freelance work and i have done uh, uh, uh work for a company i've freelanced in five different companies and i've staffed in five other companies so i know the difference of it and i know uh, what the pros and cons of that so if you are um, depending on where you're like where you are at your life and uh, if you comfort zone if you like to have a steady paycheck where you know where your money's coming from, and let's say you have a family to take care of, and then you need to have uh, uh, health insurance for your family and your kids, more than likely you may want to do, if you're a conservative, you want to go into a staff job because they provide that. Your 401k, your health insurance, and you'll never have to worry about where your next, next job is. Then you have the other characters who just, they don't mind it being a volatile. They don't mind it like, they'll look for another job, but they'll find the other job. And they're very confident about it, like, yeah, I'll find a job, that's no problem. Um, and, and they are very successful. I have plenty of friends of mine who, who love to do freelance and they will never go to staff, but as a personal choice. Um, sometimes they're very lucky and they're, they're able to find work all the time. And that would be, if you can do that and figure it out, what's the, what's the balance of it? That's you know, good for you. I don't think there's a right or wrong. Very nicely said. Um, Orchid is wondering why, like, how do you stand that up? Why? How do you keep up with new technology in your work? Do you get training, or do you customize your own skill sets on the side? So, um, learning Maya, for example, when I, like I mentioned before, I, I knew Soft the Maj and going to Maya, I was be, I was trained by my company. Um, they were like, okay, we're gonna, but it was a, it was a, it was a transition. It wasn't like, okay, we stopped using Soft the Maj, and now we're gonna use Maya. No, it just kind of became a transition. So we, I was being trained. I was still working on soft homage. And then little by little, you start picking up. And again, like I mentioned, once you have your basic, it doesn't matter. You can move on to another software, another software. There'll be another bells and whistle point dots and buttons in there. But at the end of the day, you're, you're animating. If you're animating, you just need to, where, where's my FK editor? Know your ease and outs and uh, holds uh, um, your, your uh, what is it? Um, your, your uh, learn how to put your keyframes and your, uh, you know, sub keys, then you, you're golden. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, um, it, it really doesn't matter. Did I answer the question, Kat? You did actually, thank you. Okay. And I know we're asking you a lot of questions, but you just have so much insight. And so do you, Brandon. Yeah, no, no, I, again, everyone, if, again, keep asking these questions. I think they're important for everyone. Um, don't think of it as, you know, either, as, there's nothing, no such thing as a stupid question or um, it, it's all relevant, 
maybe your question would be related to someone else that's in this chat. Um, I do have a question here. Um, uh, uh, because we talked about staying up to date with software, um, but are there any resources that you use to stay up to date with animation trends or news um, and connecting with others in the same field? Yeah, I mean, I'm a talker. So I talk to a lot of friends and I've, I've done this long enough that I have friends pretty much everywhere. So I always keep my, myself connected with LinkedIn and not just because I need to be connected, it's just I'm a friendly person and I like to talk to friends that I haven't spoken to in a while. Or there's many people that have come through the mill that have left and gone somewhere else. Um, I was lucky enough to go to uh, uh, India and meet the team in Bangalore and I, I'm, I'm friends with them. I, I chat with them on a regular basis just because they're good people, they're good friends and they give me good vibes. Um, but I try to keep up to date with, uh, again, people that I know love to do that. Um, so there's there, a few years ago, there was a kid who came freelance with us and he bought, uh, brought uh, uh, this uh, plugin called, um, what is it, the ABS uh, plugin for animation. Um, uh, and um, he was like, you know, you, you guys should try this out. And we, we started looking at him like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then that became like a solid thing for all of us to use at the mill. So now a lot of the offices have these sort of tool sets for all the animators to work on. Um, um, so it's, it's, you know, that's, that's our thing that, that, that we like to keep up. And now with the Unreal Engine, uh, the flavor of the month, like I mentioned, is MetaHumans. So we're trying right now, trying to figure out how to make this relevant in what we do, which is virtual production which is how to create content where is it could be it could done it could be done live so right now we're trying to you know figure it out learn as much as possible about metahumans so again we keep up to date by just going online and um, sometimes we get to work on a project not knowing how to do it and we uh, we quickly have to figure out how to do it i'm not going to i'm not going to lie i don't think that's the right approach but sometimes you have no choice and that you get Put in that situation but again you're not alone in an island you have a, a team of people who are in the same boat they're in the same project as you are um, and we get to exchange ideas and then we maybe the team in london knows something that we don't know and we try to you know communicate with each other um you know so we can um you know finish the product for whatever software we need to do thank you um Ooh, an, uh, anonymous, one of our anonymous participants is asking, how do you plan out characters and elements beforehand? For example, the clothes that the characters wear, their facial features. I've heard that there are concept artists for 2D animation, but I'm not sure if those exist for 3D. Yeah, I mean, for those characters like uh, the, the Apex uh, Legends or Mountain Dew, those characters are kind of set already, right? Even the, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons, those characters already um, have a model, the, the character, what they wear, their, 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 their um, you know, their, whatever is a rifle or whatever is a bag, it's already set in their character. So uh, sometimes, or a lot of the times when we do those characters, they, it, we already get them, uh, the model assets from, from the company. Uh, like this character for uh, Domination, um, Antler, uh, we, we got the model from, model from them. Uh, there was sometimes we had to remodel certain things because uh, we needed extra detail for it, like the hol holster, but the hair we had to recreate and we, we had to be in character. You know, some of them are, you know, these are copyright characters that we needed to keep them, you know, we can enhance it and make it better. Um, and, and that's what we try to do on these, on these spots. Uh, sometimes we do get a, um, um, like, a, um, like again, I, I, I comes to mind to the Schick commercial that we did. We did have a team Haldine, who was an amazing artist, who came in and created all these characters and drew them uh, different styles of it. And then, um, you know, it's much faster to get them approved by the director. If he has, let's say, 15 to pick from, he's like, I like this, this, and that. And we create them in CG. Um, so I have another question here. Um, uh, because of your knowledge in the field, um, how, how has that uh, impacted the way you view movies uh, and commercials? Um, I try not to be so, um, uh, what do I call it, too picky on it? Because you, you, you ruin the moment, right? Um, 
So to me, I, I would say one of my favorite movies that I love to watch over and over is Claws. Um, um, I, I love it. It's, in Christmas time, we put it on TV and I like to watch it. Um, I think there, it's such a good animation, such a good story. Um, and um, I just like to just watch it. And I just, I, I listen, I, you know, sometimes depending on the mood, I'll just look at it. And sometimes I, I, I look at it without audio. I just look at the visuals and that puts me into fine. Like, I'm going to look at this character and just see what are the things that make it look so good. Sometimes then if, you know, I just look at the video and I put the audio and I, and I look at it as a, as a story, what's the story content of it? Like Moana, for example, has a good story. Um, so, it's, you know, you know, ever, ever since I was in, in high school, I was a teacher of mine who, who used to, I used to have a class and he would put movies on and, that was the first time I saw movies in a different way because we saw the first 10 minutes of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. 10 minutes of it, we saw it in a whole semester because every couple of seconds he would stop the movie and be like, okay, well, what just happened? He made us think of the director's point of view. Why are we seeing what we're seeing? What is the point? What, what you know, he, you know, at one point we laugh and he stopped and like, why are you guys laughing? Oh, because he did this and this and that. So from that point on, I started to look at movies more like, what's the point? What is the point across of what they're doing? Um, and I try to do that in the movies on, on commercials. When we do a commercial, like what is the underlying story? Or what are you trying to say? Or how do you pose a character? What are you trying to portray? Is he nervous? Is he humble? Is he angry? You know, you know, this kind of helps for sure. Thank you. I, I know for myself that I uh, often look for a good rigs in, in movies. Um, one that comes to mind is The Grinch. Uh, there was a moment in the, in the movie where he pulls out this uh, candy cane and all of a sudden I believe it became like a helicopter. Um, and I just thought that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Fine with you both. Um, one of our viewers is asking a really great question when it comes to those of you within the space who are looking to pursue opportunities um, in the animation space. So Jeff, Brandon, what do you look for when looking at a portfolio? And how often is personality looked over, um, you know, looked over a beginning portfolio when applying for jobs? Brandon? Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm probably not the best example for the portfolio thing, but I will say, I know presentation is important. Um, if you can present a, a single rig in a, in a good way that shows off all of its features and that it's a, a good cohesive rig, um, that's really good. Um, uh, whereas it, if like, I, I myself, I'm not a good animator. So I often go to my friends to animate things for me. Um, I get to look at a lot of reels, so I, I always tell them, uh, make it short between no longer than two to three minutes, um, since we see so many of them. Um, and I remember asking this question when I was a student, so I'm telling you the same thing, two to three minutes, uh, don't make it longer than that, because and they're not going to stay three minutes to look at the whole thing. Impress them with your best work in the beginning, get their attention within the next, within the first 10 seconds of it, um, you know, don't feel like you have to show everything that you've done in 3D if it doesn't look good. It's better to have quality for 30 seconds that have mediocre work in a minute. So, be, you know, you know, you're representing your work, you're representing yourself. Um, and again, uh, make sure you put your best work in the front. Um, to me, that's the first step. Um, and, you know, if I look at reels and I like five reels, you know, I'll talk to them. Uh, the next step would be to talk in to having an actual interview. Uh, I like to, you know, either in person or in video, whatever, just so I can get a sense of their personality um, to see if they fit within our environment at work, um, which is a is a huge a huge plus. So I always I always try to make people that I interview at ease by just chatting with them about something else that is not related to work. And at the end, we will talk about the work that they've done and how they they did what they did on it. But I just want to get a gauge of how they express themselves, how they communicate themselves. Um, uh, those are an important factor of, of being a successful artist at the mill. We want to make sure that everything kind of 
connects really well. I'd rather have someone that is um, maybe not as good or talented as another person, but he they're more open for ideas and constructive criticism than someone who is really good and knows exactly what they want and they feel that they're the best in what they do. Um, I more than likely just pass on them um, just, just because they're not a team player. Team player and uh, collaborative efforts are, are really integral to, to the world that we're all in. Um, we are out of time, but I did want to ask you both one very important question because it does sound like from this incredibly engaged group of participants that there's such an interest in animation. And so with that in mind, I'd love to ask you both before we close out today during the special time, I wish we had hours and hours and hours, but that's not the case. Um, what is a piece of advice or a word of advice you can offer our wonderful participants outside of the portfolio review? Maybe it could just be, it could be technical, it could be, um, you know, a suggestion that you have for them as they evolve their careers on how to break into the industry or how to, how to get closer or their, dip their toe into the industry as it were. Um, you know, what are some thoughts you might have on that space or on that front? Um, I suppose some advice I could give would be to, uh, if, if you're working on your portfolio, just to make it fun, uh, make sure that you're having a good time watching it. Um, and also to make connections because connections really will get you far. Uh, some good ways to make connections would be to work on um, any uh, projects that you can find. I know that there's, um, I think it's called Artella. It's a website where people post their projects and um, some of them are paid, some of them are volunteer work, um, but you can uh, essentially sign on for the project um, and you, you can also build your reel that way. I mean, I, I, always, I always tell people like, if you, be, if you wanna be an animator, don't worry about the little details, animate. Don't be so hung up with the rig. The rig cannot give me this, the rig that. Don't make excuses. I've seen reels of people animating cubes and spheres but their timing was impeccable and it was so good. It doesn't matter about those little things that you think are an issue. Don't make that an excuse. Be an animator. If sometimes you have to go frame by frame, you would have to do it sometimes. You know, sometimes we get caught up on the animation of the computer will give me those, you create a, a key on frame 10 and you they'll go in and you create another another key on frame 20 and you let the computer do the in-betweens between 10 and, and frame 20. Meanwhile, every key is, is a frame. And you can go watch a Pixar movie and go frame by frame and you'll see that it's very methodical of where these characters are and how they, they're arcing. Look at that. Don't let the computer give you the timing. You, you do the timing. The computer just sh shows it. The computer is an expensive tool. That's all it is. So treat it like that. It's all about your talent. How much, how much uh, time you put on it is how much you're going to gain out of it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it comes up to you. There shouldn't be any excuses, guys. With the animation, there's tons of stuff out there. Um, so another advice that I can give you, um, like uh, Brendan said, stay connected, um, give it all you got, no matter what project you are put in. Sometimes, you know, whether you, you know, you get your chance, but they're going to tell you, okay, well, you're going to need to animate those characters in the back that you barely see. It doesn't matter. Do the best you can because someone else might be watching you what you're doing. And if it, if it doesn't make it to the commercial, it doesn't matter. Someone saw that you were dedicated you were you followed direction you were able to do what you were told to do so that goes a long way so just don't 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 you know don't don't take that for granted D give it all you got no matter what what sort of assignment you get beautifully said both um thank you both so much uh brandon it was such a pleasure co-hosting with you or co-moderating with you and i equally appreciate the both of your insight as fellow industry professionals and uh Jeff, as always, it's a pleasure having you as a guest. Thank Great. you for coming, guys. I hope this uh, this helps, and I hope it you know it's insightful for some people. And you know, if he has, if you guys have any questions, uh, you know, don't you know feel bad, don't feel bad, you know, reaching out. I'll give my information to to Cat and Company. Uh, so just send me a message, 
and I'll see what I can do to help. I'm an open book, guys. Jeff is definitely an open book. <laughs> well, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Awesome. All right, bye, guys. Thank you so much, Jeff, Brandon, and Kat. Um, it was really amazing hearing from all of you. And um, I really enjoyed this, this guest speaker segment. And as always, Jeff, we, we welcome you back anytime. Absolutely. That was really amazing. Thank you so much to Brandon and Jeff and Kat for that excellent presentation. I'm really going to take away that quote from Jeff of, if you like what you do, you call it passion. If you don't, you call it work. So that um, passion for creating is really going to stay with me. And I very much appreciate it. And we have come to the end of our webinar. So we are going to do a brief closing together. Um, and if you think about when we Back when we started this group a whole hour and a half ago, we talked about these ways to de-stretch, to de-stress, sorry. And some of you did um, identify stretching and breathing as one of those things. So that's what we're gonna do together to close out our group. Um, we're all gonna take a stretch, whatever feels comfortable for you together. And then we'll take a deep breath before we close. So you ready, Lyndon? Ready. All right. So I'm just gonna stretch straight up into the air. Just, um, let uh, that go. Beautiful. And we'll just take a nice deep breath together. We trust that you're doing this with us at home. We're going to breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth, and then we will close for the day. So we will inhale nice and deep and let it go. Beautiful. Nice. <laughs> Well, it looks like we've come to the end of another mega group. Um, as always, please remember to stay connected with TAP through our website, as well as our social media. And again, thank you for joining the Made in New York Animation Project mega group. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.